Hello, my name's Dr. Simon Freiler, consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to be talking about delirium and the EEG, particularly for a junior medical audience. In terms of an overview, we should all know that an EEG has a very unique role in looking at the acute disturbances of consciousness. That's particularly for um, the epilepsies, but it's also able to provide us very useful information on the electrical function of the brain in near instantaneous fashion. We've previously covered uh, the technology behind this, data processing, what happens in the normal EEG, aging, and the dementias. And it's true to say when it comes to delirium, um, that for the most part, the degree of slowing present, which is mostly what we see, um, is very much in tandem with the severity of the delirium. So the real question is, is when can it be useful and when should you be liaising for one? In terms of what we talk about acute encephalopathy and delirium, you see these terms banded about almost interchangeably. The truth is they are virtually synonymous. And it's not just a question of, uh, you know, are you a Greek or a Roman encephalopathy coming from um, a suffering of the brain in Greek and delirium coming from the Latin of going off the furrow, a uh, farming term uh, when people are not behaving um, in the way that we would expect them to behave. But it very much depends on which medical bubble you live in. So if um, one is encountering geriatricians and psychiatrists, psychologists, often the term tends to be used um, amongst themselves and in their literature about delirium when it comes to those in the intensive care environments and those uh, who work in neurosciences, we tend to refer to it as an acute encephalopathy. Um, and there's a wonderful paper which actually looks at this and, and how these are all polarised depending on which bubble we live in. And you can uh, check out um, this paper. It's a lovely read. Um, but importantly what they did was they came together and have come to some preferred terms so when we're talking about in acute encephalopathy they are saying that it is in reference to the underlying pathological process of what's going on but the delirium is the expression of it it's the clinical state and uh, really is a wonderful uh, paper to look at. Um, so in terms of delirium in hospitals, it is a massive issue. Um, anyone who's worked on an acute uh, admission uh, will know that there are lots of people who come in confused. Uh, and certainly there are people who develop confusion within hospitals as well. So about 15% of general hospital inpatients will develop a delirium, a quarter in geriatric units, and it's even higher in the post-operative cohort and in the intensive care units. It may even be something like two thirds of patients. So it's clearly a very big issue. There's a lot of literature in how we go about uh, looking at these, investigating them and treating them too. Now, in terms of causes for the acute encephalopathies, the top causes really are things like uh, toxic causes such as alcohol, drugs, infective, whether it might be something with the brain itself, uh, for example, a meningitis or maybe a viral encephalitis, or whether it's systemic infection uh, can also do this, whether they are metabolic or endocrine causes, quite commonly with um, low uh, blood sugar levels, acid-base disturbances, electrolyte disturbances, particularly with low sodiums. Hypoxia is quite an important cause, something that we've seen quite a fair bit of um, with the COVID um, hypoxemias. Organ failure, whether it's liver or kidney, whether there's brain trauma and there are other causes too but these are the the top ones amongst the elderly cohort we've already said that um, there's a higher rate of encephalopathy and delirium um, when they are in hospital the age brain frankly is just more susceptible to it so often it's quite multifactorial and even relatively minor illnesses can do this we've all seen elderly people with fairly mild urine uh, infections urinary tract infections uh, develop encephalopathies and get quite confused as a result so in terms of the EEG, it's quite simple, really. The brain has a very limited repertoire of EEG manifestations of dysfunction. Um, and we've talked about slowing already, but at the higher end of that dysfunction, the processes for either initiating or controlling electrical uh, activity and signaling fails, and the brain becomes increasingly irritable, which can lead to seizures. And the rate of deterioration is also very important. And we've all seen this with um, low sodium levels. So um, I've taken quite a difficult editorial decision. I was going to show you loads of EEGs of fascinating cases, but actually let's keep this simple. Um, background activity slows, whether it's from slowing of pre-existing, higher alpha, faster alpha, I should say, through into the theta range and then into delta. It's often fairly diffuse, 
often has a fluctuating quality, which actually mirrors the fluctuating dysfunction that we see um, in patients who have delirium. And there's often disruption of sleep and uh, sleep wake cycles and sleep architecture too. There may be some additional elements here, whether they are intermittent rhythmic delta waves, whether it's further, whether it's something which is more diffuse, triphasic waves, periodic discharges, sharp waves, spikes and seizures. If you're interested in finding out more about them, you're very welcome to Google them. It's very easy to see uh, what these things look like. Um, in terms of the EEG characteristics of metabolic and endocrine disorders, this is a wonderful paper uh, by Roland Fagel and colleagues. And quite simply, um, hypothyroidism makes things go a little bit faster, but everything else makes things go slow. And depending on the underlying issue, um, various degrees of cortical irritability manifesting themselves as uh, PLEDs, which are periodic lateralized epileptiform discharges or triphasic waves or epileptiform activity or status um, can all ensue. Um, and uh, you know, the main ones really hyponatremia, exceptionally important and um, disturbances um, with uh, sugar. Now, in terms of assessing, doing things uh, to try and work out what's the underlying cause of suspected delirium. Um, there's actually a fair paucity of information from, from direct neurological societies in terms of how to, to integrate EEG into all of this. And really, if you, you have a look at all the guidelines, uh, certainly this is one from NICE over here, um, it's very much a clinical um, decision use, using clinical tools. And most issues in medicine uh, can be resolved with simple measures in a timely fashion. So, you know, taking history from the patient, um, applying various cognitive tools are very important in making that diagnosis. And generally, EEG is not a recommended tool. So the question then becomes is, well, when might EEG be particularly useful? So let's just sort of break this down a little bit by setting. Um, so if you're working in an intensive care unit and you have a patient who may not be waking up or making some odd movements, um, it's very important to work out what their, their baseline probabilities are of having seizures and, and what's going on. So if a patient has a history, a pre-existing history of having an epilepsy, that's might be a, a greater pretest probability for there to be something going on in an epileptic fashion um, in terms of what's going on in an ITU. Um, and you know, if there's some reasonable cause uh, for seizures to be happening, whether there's been some kind of head trauma, whether there's been some bleed in the brain, or whether there's been some kind of infection in the brain, those are you know useful uh, pretest um, considerations to start thinking about when an EEG might be useful. Um, it's often used uh, when patients fail to wake up adequately from sedation and in those who need to have some kind of prognostication from anoxic injuries or cardiac arrest. And that's particularly important now um, as we call patients in uh, post-cardiac arrest to try and improve their outcomes. In terms of uh, ward patients, again, if there's a history of epilepsy, if there's a reasonable pretest probability of seizures of non combustor status, then an EEG becomes more useful, or if there's a reasonable suspicion of transient epileptic amnesia. Sometimes the medical history or there are clinical features which may suggest an unusual etiology might push you towards asking for an EEG, whether that might be a consideration of an autoimmune uh, encephalopathy, encephalitis or prion disease. Um, sometimes it can be useful if there's failure for an encephalopathy to improve um, despite trying to um, mitigate all other you know, clinical biomarkers. And there can certainly be a role in hepatic failure in certain uh, settings too. Among psychiatric patients, we often get these referrals and it's generally low yield in younger uh, populations with auditory or visual hallucinations, uh, but there's always going to be some exceptions. Um, and you know, there's always some, some autoimmune encephalitis uh, which can present itself that way. But um, you know, often there are additional features uh, which lend themselves to saying, actually, this isn't the usual type of schizophrenia or something like that, that we would normally be encountering in psychiatry. So there are circumstances where it is useful. For any of the above, I would always urge you to 
have a chat with your local neurophysiologist um, in the first instance when something might or might not be so appropriate and other other things that may be a consideration to be doing um, in the meantime. Thank you very much. I hope you found that useful. Um, just as a, a reiteration really um, for junior colleagues, for the vast majority of uh, patients who are in a delirious state, it's going to be the simple things uh, which are causing that and you know if you go through the basics in a timely way do your history taking do the examination uh, look at the observation charts uh, blood work um, septic screens those are the things that really do save lives and uh, lead to rapid resolution of problems uh, when things are addressed in a timely fashion and um, the EEG certainly does have a place um, but it's in a far more focused um, setting than most people think of really. So I hope you found that useful. Please do support the channel by liking, sharing and subscribing and hopefully see you in the next video, hopefully not too long um, in, the, in the future. All the very best.